gang, welcome to Wicked Weather. I'm your host, Peter Lovasco, and it is a Saturday night, September 20th. And I got to tell you, we're going to have a great show for you tonight. I have um, my friend Mike Haggett up in um, Maine. He's on with us tonight, weather enthusiast, uh, weather forecaster. Uh, he was a DJ, he did sports, um, and then he turned into, um, a, he's got this great website online. You can check it out. He'll tell you all about that. So I'm glad to have him. Also, I have uh, Quincy Vogel, Vagel, Vogel on tonight. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. And um, he is a meteorologist out of Connecticut, um, resides out of Danbury, and he is a storm chaser, folks. So any questions you want to ask him, uh, it's going to be amazing. He's been all over the country, so we're going to find out where he hasn't been covering storms. Uh, but before we get to our guests, uh, right now current temperature out here in Gloucester, Mass., is uh, 58 degrees, 59 degrees, two point, right around 56. And we have a chance of a few showers late tonight and early tomorrow morning. I think that storm system is going to go out to our southeast, so we don't have to worry about that. All right, so I'm going to bring in, after a crazy day with my daughter and my sister at the Pet Expo today, we were up in uh, Wilmington, Mass. at Shriners. We had a great time up there. The Shriners really put on a lot of fun shows um, and events. Got to meet um, my old guest I had on last week, Rob Gutro, and he signed a couple books for me, so that was fun to meet him. Um, he flew all the way up from Maryland, and he's also a, a meteorologist in the weather field. All right, so I'm going to welcome in Mike Haggett and Quincy Vagel. Did I say that right, Quincy? Is it Vagel or yeah, Vogel? Yeah, you, you got it. It's Vagel. Rhymes with Vagel, so you got it. Well, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Quincy. Welcome to the show, Mike. Um, let's first start off with you, Mike. Why don't you uh, tell the listeners out there what it is that you do um, and what you uh, what brought you into the weather? Well, I'm a I forecast predominantly for the western half of the state of Maine, which includes uh, ski country and the coast and all points in between. It's something I started doing about uh, going on almost three years ago now. Um, you know, I started a website, uh, westernmewx.com. As well as I have a Facebook page, Western Maine Weather. You can also find me on Twitter at Western M E W X. Um, you know, I, I basically take a look at the weather in, in our in this region. I've been I've lived in this region for 45 years. Um, know the patterns pretty well, um, and uh, you know it's um, it's been one of those things that kind of resonated with me as a kid. And uh, through life, I. Uh, just get sidetracked into doing other things. Math wasn't my strong point in school, so kind of meteorology got, kind of got ruled out. But uh, I always no, had a love too, forecasting, too. you know. And 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 uh, so I started uh, back uh, three years ago. I got connected with uh, Charlie Lepresti from WGME TV. He kind of gave me a rundown through of everything that he uses for for uh, forecasting programs and whatnot. And I started with there and. And slowly but surely, over time, picking up little bits of pieces of information from from others, and going in and sitting down with Charlie a couple times a year, and and working with some great folks such as Christine Ferreira at the WGAL down in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and and uh, Bernie Reno, of course, with AccuWeather. Uh, I've learned a lot from those folks, and uh, you know, it's to the point where I'm uh, I'm pretty comfortable as far as the forecast that I do now, and uh, you know, being able to use the, the same similar tools that they do, and uh, and I've you know, and and, and being able to uh, apply that in my own region. Plus, you know, you can't rule out local know-how, and I know Quincy does a great job um, with his Connecticut forecast because uh, he's obviously lived in that area for a long time, and. You know, the models tell you one thing, but, you know, local know-how tells you something else. And, and when you see the models doing their thing and, and you factor in what goes on locally around here, I mean, there's such a convergent zone between Mount Washington and, and, and the mountains and and, uh, and the ocean here that, uh, you know, you know that the foothills are going to going to be a play for some severe weather at times and or some harsher weather than what the models indicate. So, I mean, you know, you, you take all that in, in, the, in the consideration and, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's been a fascinating journey here for me for the last three years as I've evolved into this. That's awesome, Mike. That's awesome. You know, I got to tell you, hats off to you, man, because uh, you're doing a great job. Um, a lot of people look up to you on Twitter. 
Uh, Facebook, you have your own website. Um, you have your own web page. Um, and, you know, you're just doing a terrific job. And, you know, I get a lot of my reliable information from you as well um, when I'm lost in my own weather world. Um, but, you know, you mainly forecast Maine, but you do help me out down here in Essex County as well, and I really appreciate that, buddy. Well, I mean, we're all in the same region, and, I mean, I don't know Cape Ann for the life of me. I mean, yeah. even though it's 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 one of those deals that, you know, I'm obviously I'm looking at the stuff because I'm yeah. paying attention to what's going on along the coast and whatnot. So, I mean, I can't help but to... Uh, um, to take a, to, to pay attention to what's going on with you down there and and whatnot right. because uh, you know it's it's uh, it's all a part of the package. Whatever you've got going on down there, chances are I'm going to get a piece of it up my way. Exactly, Quincy. How about yourself, man? Uh, you're a meteorologist. Hey, you look. made it. You made it through the math problems that we have. It. <laughs> um, tell us about tell us about yourself and what it is that you love to do. Well, it's funny you should talk about the math. Um, ever since I was a kid, I've been fascinated by weather, of course, but math, once I got to college, that kind of changed my tune on that. I actually wanted to be a math teacher at one point, but then I hit something called calculus, and yeah. I made it through math in college, but it was a struggle. Um, I went to school in Western Connecticut State University, and I was in Danbury, so my Twitter handle is naturally at Danbury Weather. I lived in Danbury for about eight years. But I've been in Connecticut my whole life, so that's 27 years of forecasting. Well, no, 27 years of, ex- of living there. <laughs> that's years of forecasting. Yeah, I, I wasn't forecasting as a baby, I can tell you that. But I've worked at a local TV station as a weather producer. I actually had a great opportunity this past August to actually be an on-air meteorologist out in Illinois on a temporary assignment. But I'm guessing your folks are going to want to know where this whole storm chasing bit came in. Well, this spring I took some time off from my work to go out in the Midwest for the first time and basically throw myself in the whole mix of storm chasing. So I've actually had five trips out to the Midwest this year, which we'll get into more later on. But what I'm doing right now is I'm doing some research. I'm doing some freelance weather forecasting. I keep up with my Twitter and Facebook on a daily basis. But I'm currently exploring what options I want to follow. But whatever the path takes me, it's weather forecasting and meteorology has been a, a passion for so long. So. Excellent, excellent. Um, how long have you been um, int- uh, actually interested in chasing storms? What, what got you into storm chasing, Quincy? Or actually, well, that- were you a kid? did you get did you answer, did you get that? Um, what actually got you into storm chasing? Was it watching well, shows growing up as a kid, or did you just want to do it? Well, there's actually two sides to it. I've Ever since I was a little kid, I'd always have a dream. I had dreams of tornadoes all the time, whether they were chasing me or I was chasing them. But I never really seriously thought about storm chasing until late last year. Actually, I spoke with my aunt last summer who lives in Oklahoma, and she's like, hey, Quincy, you got to come out to the plains in the Midwest to storm chase. And I was kind of like, well, I don't know. It's going to cost a lot of money. I have a job. Well, last fall, I took a trip on a weekend. I drove nonstop out to Iowa for my first taste, and... It's like once you do it once, you want to do it more. And I this spring, when I once I had a chance to actually go out and storm chase, I, I I just wanted to do it and get the thick of it. And this it's been a, it's been tough the last couple of years because there hasn't been a whole lot of severe weather. And even my first few trips this year, there wasn't a whole lot to see. But like I said before, the more you do it, even if you're not successful, it's the more you, you want to do it. And it's a whole adrenaline rush. So yeah, the TV watching TV shows and watching people like Reed Timmer was a part of it, but I think the biggest thing for me was just the thrill and adrenaline rush. And I'm also really big into photography too. So that element of catching a storm and catching all the beauty. My passion. Yeah. I'm listening. You're here. So any Hello? specific questions on that or do we want to, which direction we want uh, to go with it? Well, what I want to know is, during the chase, what gets you into the chase? What gives you all your information as far as this is where I'm going to travel today, out Midwest Ohio? I know you look at all the graphs and, and all the model maps, um, and you're so good at it because you really get right in the line of these things. I mean, do you have a core punch? Well, well, first we'll go back to how how do I figure out where my destination point will be. And a lot of people are probably familiar with the Storm Prediction Center, and although I do read their discussions, I don't. Some storm chasers will use the Storm Prediction Center forecast as like a bullseye. I right. look at all the computer models. I love the high-resolution computer models, especially the, we call it the HER, the HRRR. I'll look yep. at that the morning of the storm chase and decide, okay, where is this model really pinpointing the focal point here? And kind of, I go to a point, 
But there have been times where I've had to drive one, two, three hundred miles in a span of just a couple of hours to catch up, and it's it's really storm chasing is not a it's not a perfect science either. It's kind of you you have a general idea of where you will go, but you have to be flexible about where you might go. And as far as right. core punching goes, the, when when we say core punching, you usually that's usually when you hit the, the large hail and you get the really strong winds and the storms. And I'm just driving a little, little Toyota Camry, so I don't really have a vehicle to kind of core punch as someone like Reed Timmer might. But there have been a few times where I've had some close calls, and I do have a few hail dents on my car. So, But usually I want to take a step back and kind of get as close to the storm as possible, but not so close that I'm getting pegged with baseball-sized hail or whatever. So. Right. And now, actually, you... actually, as far – yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. Yep. It was one of my first actual tornado chases was this year. You, some of you may have heard of the Mayflower. There was an EF4 tornado that ripped through Arkansas. And anyone who knows storm chasing, you don't want to storm chase a tornado from the north. But I was north of the storm, and I was racing south on whatever highway that was towards Little Rock. And I literally core punched the storm and got too close to the tornado, and I had actually had to turn around, and I was kind of hauling it out of there. And I actually core punched twice accidentally, but it was either that or get hit by an EF4 tornado. So it's really – core punching is really – unless you have a vehicle at like a tank or something that's really heavy duty, it's, it's not exactly a smart idea. I've, I've seen storm chasers get their windshield smashed out and glass in their face, and that's not exactly my um, cup of tea, if you will. Do you Have you seen a Dominator go by? I've I, I seen you take pictures. of Was that you out there with a the Dominator? Oh. I've the crazy thing is is I've crossed paths with a dominator more than any other storm chaser probably six or seven times this year and mostly <laughs> accidentally we just happen to be in the right place at the right time so that's, that's a good thing cool. though so you're in the right area you know they're in the right area because <laughs> Reed Timmer and then they're yeah. always right on it you know so it's like there goes the dominator follow the dominator well they have three now right they got dominate one dominate two and the dominate three and I think they want to come out with another yeah. one right he's talking about oh, yeah, like a dominator four, four. It like. <laughs> so. So when you're out in that area and, and you drive to where you're going, it's like a long process. So you got you got to plan your travel, you got to plan your stay, um, you got to plan your stop time, downtime. So you're just sitting, you're looking at the sky, you're saying, okay, which direction am I going to go in? What do you use for um, uh, that material out there when you're out there traveling in the Midwest or wherever you do go? Which is usually the Midwest. Yeah, Midwest, and then sometimes as go as far west as the, the Great Plains, but the Midwest, because it's a little bit closer, and the way the pattern for them this year, the Midwest has really been hit a lot. So, But as far as data goes, I actually, I, I'm pretty simple. All I have is my iPhone, laptop, and a tablet, and I'm basically running radar scope, um, actual live radar, satellite, and kind of just the basics. And a lot of it's just intuition, and there's a little bit of a luck factor as well. So, Yeah. Uh, so that's another thing I was wondering is how do you always catch these nice storms? I mean, you see the structures coming in, you know how to stay ahead of it, or do you stay a little bit behind it when you're following chasing storms? And are you really careful on the road? Because I know a lot of storm chasers out there really travel fast. You know, you don't want to put your life in any danger when it comes to a severe storm or a tornado warned storm. You don't want to get too close. How close do you get to these storms, Quincy? I've seen the well, tornado in the background of you, so that was pretty close. Yeah, the closest I've come, well, let's actually take a step back. So my second storm chase in my life last year was in November, on November 17th in Illinois and Indiana, and that was a, a, one of the biggest fall tornado outbreaks in quite a while. But I actually got too close in that storm. I was within, well, based on radar, within a couple hundred yards of a, a couple of a tornado warning. And I, the wind was so strong that it ripped my windshield wipers off. And in that, I took a step back, and I kind of – that storm chase day was a big learning experience because I learned firsthand it's not always about getting as close as you can. But this past June, I had a three-day stretch where I saw eight tornadoes, and eventually on that third day, which is that day where I took the tornado selfie, I said, you know what? If I see a storm today, I want to get as close as possible. So I was a couple hundred yards away from another EF4, and that's where I took that selfie. And that, that, was, a, that was actually a really fun chase up there in wow. South Dakota. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could be chasing for hours and hours, and it just would be going. It just be an all night event. Do you usually call it after a certain amount of darkness starts coming in once the sun goes down? Yeah, for yeah, for me, I I usually call it off when it, when it, when the sun goes down. There was one chase in on April twenty eighth, I think, in Mississippi, where tornadoes kept going into the night, and I was actually with another couple that were also chasing. And once the sun went down, I said, "Hey guys, I." not really feeling this. And usually I cut it off because there's two factors. One, it's the safety factor. You, you can't really see what's coming. 
Right. And then the other thing is, what's, what's the point of chasing a tornado if it's pitch black because you can't really get footage? I mean, you might see damage, but for me, the, a lot of the fun's out of it because you could be the one getting chased at night. So I usually Absolutely. sunset when yeah. I call it off. Absolutely, because you don't have no idea. I remember I was watching this, a live cam on uh, TVN, and the guy has a camera on the back of his vehicle, and you could actually see a tornado down behind him, and he didn't even know. <laughs> I'm like trying to say, <laughs> move, move. But he can't hear me because <laughs> I wasn't live connected to him. But um, yeah, that's great. I mean, it takes a lot to uh, to be a storm chaser. You got to have the patience. Um, you got to have the adrenaline rush, and, and 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 you can't have any fear as far as if you get into a storm because sometimes they can do a right turn, they can do a back turn, they can catch you off guard. We've seen that happen with a few storm chases, um, you know, that weren't so lucky. Um, but the other thing is too is there's a lot of storm chaser traffic out there. I've noticed when I've been tracking you guys on online um, on my laptop, um, how how congested does it get in one area? Because I know you guys have to travel down dirt roads, off roads, roads that aren't on GPS. So does that cause a, a hazard problem as far as uh, storm chasing goes? If there are too many people in that same area, it, it definitely can, and it's on days that are really highly anticipated that you get a lot of chasers in a very close proximity. And on June 16th, the day with the, the twin tornadoes, there was, was a amazing. lot of chasers on one. There was a lot of chasers on one strip, and there were actually there was one guy that was a chaser that drove off the road because, well, I don't know exactly why, but there was just so much chaser traffic, and there, there was debris in the road, and you have a tornado, two tornadoes in front of you. It can be it can be really dangerous, and I, I'm. It's probably a good thing that more people haven't been injured, but it's also a little bit surprising because some of these storm chasers, they're not exactly out there being safe, you know. Right, right. Well, man, that's great, man. Hats off to you. And I still definitely want to go out there and uh, chase with you uh, one of these days um, next spring. Um, I think we're coming out of the season now. Do you think we're safe, or do you think there's going to be more spurts maybe in the late fall, early winter where those spring patterns can still set up in the wintertime? Yeah, there's actually there's the the typical tornado season you think of is usually April, May, maybe into June. There's also a secondary season that's October, November, and even in December sometimes. It's usually a, yeah. a weaker secondary season, but yeah. as last year proved to us, we had a big outbreak last year on October October 4th, and then another outbreak on November 17th. So it really depends on the year, but if if there was going to be an outbreak, it would, we would maybe see maybe one or two as opposed to the spring where you can get a string of many of them in a row. So we'll have to see how it goes. I mean, you have a pretty active pattern, but the, se- the severe season has been pretty quiet for the most part this year. We'll see if the trend continues. One more question before I get to Mike. Um, as far as tornado season has been going in New England, um, have you seen it just this activity spike up in the last few years, especially this year um, with that EF2 that hit Revere, which was really – very rare. It's their first tornado ever, and I talked about this with a lot of my guests. I just want um, perspective from other meteorologists out there um, on their thoughts as to are we going to be getting into more summer seasons where we are going to start seeing more and more uh, touchdowns here in southern New England, or is this just has been going on, but it just so many more people out there on the Internet are reporting it? Well, I think we just touched on it. I think the reporting aspect of it is one piece. We're seeing more reports, but we're also seeing – better ability from the National Weather Service to track these, like the lesser, the EF0 tornadoes. But as far as the severe weather goes in the Northeast, it can be really hit and miss. You can have a three- or four-year streak where you have barely anything, or then you can have a year like 2000, was it 2011 when you have the EF3 that went through. So it's really hit and miss. It's kind of almost all or nothing. Last year we had four tornadoes in Connecticut, and then this year we only had one week one. So it, it's really hit and miss. I wouldn't read too much into it, but I do think that with more people out there reporting in the field, and because it is hard to see storms in the Northeast with all the trees and stuff, maybe, maybe by having more people out there, we may actually have more reports. So we'll have to see how that how that trend goes. Gotcha. Mike. Yes, sir. As far as Maine weather, severe weather goes, how hard is it to predict your, your weather up there? I've seen you forecasting thunderstorms, severe, you know, telling the public, watch out, We, you know, this is a you know, serious situation. We want to make sure that everybody's alert, that, you know, thunderstorms are going to come down, this is going to happen. But then the National Weather Service isn't agreeing or the Storms Prediction Center is not agreeing with what you have to say. And, man, I got to tell you, hats off to you. You always get it right. They always form in that area. How hard is it to form up there in the mountains? 
Well, it's it's when you take a look at the models and you know the area as well as I do, you can you can see where, you know, when you when you get an up and, and you've got warm air coming in aloft from the west, and you can almost you can almost see it happening just as just as I as I look at guidance, and you know there's always that little quirky little zone there in the foothills that gets overlooked by models, and 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 I think that. In, in cases of this year where I felt that Storm Prediction Center or even the National Weather Service was kind of unpredicting um, some of the outbreaks that we had here, I mean, we had, we've had, what, three? We had three tornadoes in my region this year, and none of which did the Storm Prediction Center or the National Weather Service have us under any sort of severe watch. Um, you know, you, you, the warm fronts coming up the coast, I think that really that kind of tips things off for me. That, that That's the big thing. And, you know, it, it's not so much the forecasting part for me, I think I've got a pretty good handle on. The thing that, that bothers me sometimes is getting that word out to others. And, you know, I use, I use my Twitter account, I use my Facebook page, you know, and, and God bless my followers, all those that are listening tonight. I mean, they share my stuff. They get it out there, and and I mean one one of the biggest severe outbreak days that we had. I mean I'm I lost track of how many page views that that we had, and I also logged it onto my uh, my website too, and uh, to get it out that way because I have a bunch of people that have subscribed to my uh, my website updates. Um, but I mean that's the hard part is getting the word out. The easy part is almost doing the forecasting. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and putting people on alert and, uh, you know, knock on wood, I had a good year this year. Um, you know, not every year is going to be like this. There's always going to be once in a while that I, and I may end up missing something, but, you know, it's like, you just, you know, it's, it's one of those things like, you know, you learn how to tie your shoe as a kid and it's just like, you know, for me, now that I have models to go, go by to be able to, you know, see what the atmosphere is, is doing and then understanding my region and how the whole situation sets itself up. I mean, that's basically how I, um, the way that I look at it and are able to uh, get a pretty good handle on forecasting uh, severe storms around here. Yeah, and, and again, you're doing a great job, man, and I'm so glad that you came back. You were going to give it a break for a while. Um, family first or something. I forget what you tweeted about that. Um, and then you came back. So, I mean, it's always good to have your source and yours, Quincy, on Twitter because, you know, we can ask each other anything. We're all we're all in different areas at the same time. So, weather's different everywhere, you know. Um, guys, thoughts on um, this storm off of um, Florida, ca- Southern Carolina. Uh, looks a little stronger than uh, previously uh, mo- forecast and modeled. Is this thing going to make a closer run to us? Well, go ahead, Q. Yeah, the latest data I've looked at, it looks like a close call, but I I really don't think most of us, maybe outside of far eastern New England, will get a whole lot out of it. I think it is still an interesting scenario, but with the fact that there's a cold front that's coming in through the Great Lakes that's so far west, it's not going to come in quick enough to really pick this thing and race it up towards the coast and do like a left turn. But at the least, it is kind of um, fun to watch out there. They're going to have a little, maybe a subtropical or whatever you want, a quasi-tropical system come close to us. But I don't think we're we'll like, going to get a whole lot out of it. Or like a hybrid. It's it, it's pretty it's pretty large in size, actually, looking at the water vapor anyways. But it's uh, it's nice to look at. We haven't had much to look at. What are your thoughts, Mike? Well, when I looked at it, I kind of kept an eye on it here for the last couple of days. And, uh you know, I think Southern Maine, and I mentioned it in my update this morning. I think Southern Maine may see a couple of sto- a couple of showers out of it, kind of isolated, hit or miss. Because you can you can tell by looking at it and, and looking at the 500 millibar, you got a warm you got a warm front that's coming up through um, that's going to tag on to some of that moisture, I think, and draw a little bit of it up my way. But I don't expect that it's going to be a whole lot. I haven't seen guidance this afternoon, but. Uh, um, this morning's guidance that I was basically going on, I thought through that pretty good because any time you get a storm like that that has tropical characteristics, you know, you always got to kind of take a look at it because, I mean, more or less around here in a situation such as this, it's just going to bring a little bit more rain than, than anything else. And knowing the fact that a lot of my followers, you know, they have, they like to do stuff on, on the weekends like we all do and get outside and, and, and try to get some, get some wood cut or, you know, chores done or whatever. And, and, 
you know, so I always, I always tend to keep an eye on stuff like that a little bit closer than if it was during the week because you got so many folks out there that are trying to get things done. But, but like I said, I mean, I, we may see a couple of spot showers in southern Maine from it, but I don't really expect a whole lot more. Maybe maybe some more a little bit further south down your way, Peter. But, you know, at this point here, I mean, I, I think, I think uh, Quincy's right. I you know, the, the the cold front is trailing a little bit too far west. and yeah. But I will say this, the folks in uh, my folks that follow me in the Maritimes and that I follow in, 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 uh, <clears throat> in the Canadian Maritime areas up there, they are watching it very closely because they are going to have a convergence zone area of right, right around Nova Scotia, um, Newfoundland, where the front and that storm is going to end up coming together. And, uh, and I was seeing some... Uh, guidance earlier the fact that they could get uh, 50 to 60 knot winds over uh, most of newfoundland uh, from the storm once the once the two come together and uh, work its way up further northeast cool yeah i actually uh my friend uh dave Marciano, you guys probably know dave Marciano from wicked tuna um tweeted me today asking me if they're going fishing what's the weather conditions like and i'm like oh no i'm on the spot <laughs> But um, no, it wasn't much going on. I mean, it's all further out on the east side. But I had to tell them, just keep your heads up, keep your eyes up. If you're going 50, 100 miles offshore, you want to make sure that, um, you know, you're just prepared. Because you never know, just a little jog 20 miles west off computer models. And uh, they're in it, you know. It's really hard to predict the weather out there in the, in the ocean. How about Cabo San Lucas, guys? Um, Hurricane Idel, Adol, that went up through there. That wasn't expected to go hit them head on. The center was supposed to be about, from what I saw, the forecast track by the National Hurricane Center was about 50, 60 miles further offshore. So um, it goes to tell you that you never really know if the track's going to you know, stand with a storm system coming up the coastline or going to Cabo San Lucas. And how rare is that, Quincy, to have a hurricane going into the Baja, uh, Mexico, and what, tracking right up? Uh, the the Gulf there, right up into uh, Arizona, and they're flooding them out there right now? Yeah, it's only happened a few times, and actually, even though I'm not a West Coast guy, I'm always fascinated with the potential for a tropical storm to either go up towards California or go up the Baja, and there have been a few cases where a storm has gotten just enough of that staying on the ocean just long enough to kind of maintain itself, and this was one of those rare um, rare cases, so it was interesting to watch. Um, rare, but it has happened uh, Every I don't know, maybe every ten, twenty years or something. But but yeah, I mean, if anyone needs it, California, not so much Arizona. They've had a insane amount of rain over the past few weeks. Yeah, one you know, things that, that, one of the things that struck me about the storm, if I can interject here for a moment, Peter, is yeah, go ahead, buddy, go ahead. One of the things that we, one of the things that we've learned about guidance over the years is stuff that kind of brews in the southwestern part of the country, whether it's you know in the United States or. Uh, or on that, along that, uh, the uh, the west coast of uh, Mexico, models seem to have a really hard time trying to figure that stuff out. And we we there was there was a case in point here. I don't know if it was a year or so ago, but we had a lot of we had some storms that were kind of get kind of get going along. Um, you know, try to start getting some energy, some weak energy over over Arizona and into New Mexico. They get through Texas and start tapping into some Gulf moisture. And it was befuddling a lot of meteorologists because of the fact that the the European was, was really losing it and the GFS with with its feedback issues and whatnot just could not make heads or tails out of what direction and, and what intensity that it was going to go for even more than a day. I mean, they almost had a mind of their own. And and uh, when I was looking at this, and I, didn't, I don't really track that – that area either but you know seeing you know the tweets and and kind of doing a little digging when i had a moment and whatnot i i could i saw the original track that the nhc had out for that and i could and then then, then it wavered back in and i was saying oh, maybe there's something to this maybe a little bit further west too where you know where this uh where the models just have almost have a blind spot and really don't know how to handle it i don't know what quincy thinks about that no, I do think there's some model blindness. I mean, there's a lot of, even forgetting the models, there's a lot of factors over there. You have you have the West Coast, you have the Pacific Ocean, you have the subtropical jet coming in. You also have the mountains, the Rocky Mountains. There's also almost kind of like a little, I wouldn't say Bermuda Triangle, but in a way there's a little bit of a loss of data. And then 
the European model, I heard somewhere there's some kind of bias with handling troughs out in the southwest. I've, I haven't really followed it closely, so I'm not really sure. So you factor in models having a tough time, possible lack of data, and you combine those couple of things, and that can be just enough to throw something, throw a forecast off. Yeah. I mean, has has a hurricane or, or well, let's just say, tropical storm ever hit San Diego? I haven't there, really looked back in the analogs. I th- if I remember correctly, there was only one hurricane that ever made landfall in Southern California, and that was a long time ago. There have been remnant tropical systems, but it's just very tough to get one that far north and west. As um, the Baja has been hit several times, but California, as you know, there's cooler waters as you get further north. Usually these storms recur before they even get that far up there. So I don't know if San Diego's been directly hit, but SoCal has been hit a couple of times, but it's very rare, very rare. Quincy, question. Why is it that California is so hot? My brother lives out in San Diego, um, the uh, Orange County. The water temperatures are so much cooler there than they are on the East Coast or in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but, again, they're hot. Year round, almost out there. I mean, I think their average low in the winter times maybe fifty-five, sixty degrees or so. Um, but they're still out there, uh, you know, boiling in the nineties, the eighties, and nineties. Why are the water temperatures so cooler out there, considering that they have all well, that heating going on? Well, California is pretty interesting because there's almost like two or three different climates all within one state because California is a big state. You have like Death Valley and you have the southern interior part that boils well over 100 degrees. If you live on the immediate coast of California, because the predominant wind direction is usually out of the west, you're usually almost always in the 60s and 70s right along the immediate coast. But the reason the water is relatively cool is because the the prevailing flow is from west to east and all this water is just turning over itself. Where on the east coast, the air is falling over all this land, so the land heats up a lot. You have the Gulf Stream feeding warm water up there. So California is just a really unique state. And then plus you have the you have the mountain range. You have the mountain range on eastern California. So all the wind hits the mountains. You have the upslope, and you're really hot in the valleys there. But as soon as you get to the mountains, things change. There's almost, I guess you could say, three different climates in California. So it's a little, little, little tough to explain, and I'm not a California expert when it comes to weather, but that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, you're both more New Englanders, and that's what, you know, and I like that. <laughs> I, I don't know how to forecast California weather. I don't know what's going on out there. All I know is our weather comes either from the west or the north or the east or south, and it, it just moves around. Like, I, you know, our winter time comes from Canada. Right now, we still have what, um, as Rob Gutro was telling me last week, uh, my guest on my show, um, that the ice caps are still pretty big up there, um, up in the Arctic. Um, and that's a sign of a uh, busy winter here in New England. So to both of you, um, what what's going to make your forecast for this winter? I mean, what are you looking at um, as far as analogs or model data? I know I don't, I'm don't. i not a big fan of the long range. Um, Farmer's Almanac, I'm not a big fan, but I do read it. Uh, but where do you guys get your information as to uh, making your winter forecast? And what are you both seeing? as far as winter goes. I'll start with you first, Quincy. Well, kind of like you said, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of these long-term seasonal forecasts, and I won't go specific and say how much snow, but as far as temperature goes, what we, what we saw last winter was, last winter was a good analog with 93, 94, where yeah. we started cold, cold and dry, but then we got cold and snowy. And we I kind of saw that pattern by late December, early January. But the biggest thing last winter was a big, massive ridge over Alaska and then the eastern Pacific, which allowed for a big trough to be in the east coast, which brought cold air and storminess. Now, this year, again, it's a little tough to make these long-range predictions, but as it stands right now, there's still a lot of ridging out by Alaska, and there's still a lot of very warm ocean temperatures over there. But I think the pattern's starting to break down. But if I had to venture a guess, and again, this is just a guess and there's not a whole lot of science behind it, I would not be surprised if we have another chilly or cold winter. But as far as snow goes, it's really tough to say, and I'm not going to I'm not gonna venture any guesses with snowfall. So that's the, that's my two cents on it, at least. Mike? Well, I, I, agree. I agree with a lot of what Quincy said. I think we're starting to see that western ridge modify a little bit, and I think that, that, that is a player. I think the ice is a player. Um, <clears throat> over on the other side of, uh, um, I'm I'm real curious to see what happens with Siberia, 
here in the next couple of weeks because if they start getting early snow out there, that's a, that's a telltale indication that uh, we could be in for it. And the ice on the uh, over on the in the eastern hemispheres is, uh, especially on the Asia side, is really uh, held up much better than uh, what some uh, were, were indicating or, or even still saying at this point. But, I mean, I, I think I think that plays into it. I think uh, I think cold weather, uh, the earlier cold weather that we've seen here is, uh, is a bit of a bellwether too. I don't, as far as snow goes, I, and my, my instinct, and this is just a gut instinct, I've, I've kind of played around with some of the long-range stuff. I mean, again, I mean, it's tough to take it with any sort of validity, um, but my my inkling here is the fact that we might see a little bit above average snow here in, in this part of the state, which I know will make ski country very happy. Um, they went long last year because we had a long winter, and, and they, they kept going. They, they shut down. They still had snow on the hill. So, I mean, i, I got to think that, uh, you know, that uh, – We'll see something similar this year, and, and uh, but I don't. I think as far as temperatures go, I mean, you see some of this bizarre stuff like this Empire News article, and some of these, some of this other garbage that's getting posted on the internet, and and you know, you really scratch your head about it because there isn't really much validity to it. And but uh, just just seeing the general trend, looking at the 200 millibar, the way that it's setting up now and whatnot, I, I tend to think that we might see a little bit more than the average snowfall but nothing alarming and and i think temperatures uh maybe maybe a touch on the cool side um but you know you know it's 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 new england you're gonna get snow you're gonna get sleet you're gonna get freezing rain um you're gonna have you're gonna have temperatures you know that are gonna flirt around zero at times and you know you're gonna have your days where you know you're gonna have we'll have periods up here in maine where we'll go a couple of weeks where we won't see 32 degrees for a high temperature. And I mean, that's just, that's just the norm. And, and to predict that anything above and beyond that is, 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 is quite difficult. Yeah. You guys had a really rough winter up there last year. I remember seeing the tweets coming from you. <laughs> we need a break, mother nature, ice storm, ice storm, cold, cold. And the ice didn't melt off the trees or the power lines. It was just crazy for you guys up there. I'm, I'm no, it's a mess. At- Oh yeah, you, you guys are a total mess. I'm looking at a really active storm track this season for some th- some reason. Um, we're going. I, I I believe we're going into an El Nino. Um, if not, it's already starting up. Um, shortly. Um, I guess the water temperatures were starting to warm, right? Off uh, the Pacific, is that what we were looking at? Everything yeah, it looks I've like there was so far... there was some modification, but sorry to cut you off. No, go ahead. Everything. That... Everything that I've seen on as far as the El Nino El Nino goes is it's like it's just it's like barely hanging on. Um a lot of the some of the people I follow on Twitter and, and uh some of the things that I read on it from some of those that are far more educated at at uh, gauging the uh um the El Ninos than I am uh, really aren't that bullish on the whole idea. <laughs> Um, there was there was a lot of talk about it back in the spring and the, the, the early summer, but things just didn't pan out again. And then so then all right, and then you got to take into those into consideration what the what the longer term models are saying. And uh, but based on everything that I've seen, I mean, if we're in El Nino pattern, it is just a fraction. Um, above well, it's just than, not uh, what's normal. Yeah. yeah, no, it's just about to start. Um, what do you think, Quincy? Yeah, I think the same thing. It's it's very marginal, and when, I, I, maybe I'm different than some people, but I don't put a, a ton of stock into the El Nino, La Nina affecting our winter because all it takes is one storm to really throw. Every, to, people are going to remember yeah. a winter with by one. Yeah. Let's say one blizzard, but the but the entire winter was otherwise quiet. People are going to remember it by that one storm. And going back to a point that Mike said before, it's New England. We're going to have a little bit of everything. Um, there's winters like 95, 96 where temperatures were above average, but we had way above average snowfall. So just because it's warm doesn't mean it can't snow. And then likewise, it can be cold and dry. So it's really, yeah. it's, it's, it's almost on a case-by-case basis. And did, did we have that one storm that brought the heavy snowfall amounts, or did we have the jet, jet stream just in, just in the right spot? There's really a lot of variables that go into it. So That's a great point. And I want to bring this point up too, because of the fact that, you know, you take a look at rainfall totals. I know you, Folks down in uh, down in southern New England here are kind of almost 
flirting with drought stage and and up here yeah. we had one storm here back in uh, uh back in august that uh dumped almost seven inches of rain in portland and uh that was know, just a thunderstorm, storm a, right that was that was just that was just a thunderstorm and, and yeah. you know everything all lined up just perfect for that to happen but if you take that storm out of the out of the picture i mean we probably would have been below normal as far as rain total goes you know so i mean it it, it is it, it is quirky things like that there'll be one storm where you're going to get a big dump and then everybody's going to use that but i mean you almost have to take it all right Take out the take out the worst case scenario, worst case storm, and and uh, and then compare that those totals to normal to kind of see where you where you end up because there's always going to be those freak storms that are going to happen. Well, here's what I see, guys, and um, I, I don't know. This is my perspective. We came into summer pretty late this year. Um, well, I think we had one ninety or it's two ninety degree days in early July or late June, early July, and then summer just disappeared and didn't show up until. Late late August September, so with summer coming late, our water temperatures are still um, I, I I what was sixty six sixty seven off Cape Ann, Mike. I think you guys are at least sixty four up there in the Gulf of Maine or off the Maine coast. Portland I think is sixty three sixty four, and Quincy off the coast of Long Island and Connecticut. I think you guys are close to seventy seventy five still. Those water temps are really warm, so that could also play play on our tropical season maybe extending a little bit late past November and maybe we might see some activity pick up in the next couple of weeks. So with summer starting late, um, the tropics starting off pretty late, um, maybe our winter will start off pretty late. Does that all coincide with one another? Well, again, there's a lot of factors that go into this, and the, some of the longer-range patterns show a ridge developing in the east, and a ridge in the east could mean more warmth, but it could actually keep any storms away from here. It could have, like, a block yeah. of high. Um, yeah. and, but actually, and actually, almost to kind of contradict that, the, the Great Lakes are still well below average temperatures. Ca- uh, Canada's still kind of dry, cold and dry. And like you said before, our weather in winter usually comes from the northwest, so all these storms might be moving over a colder-than-normal normal, normal, normal surface. So... It's it's really hard it's really hard to say and that's why I'm not a huge fan of the seasonal forecast because yeah. all it takes is one storm to change it and then you could think oh well the water's warm but the land's cold so it's it's almost like a roll of the dice I mean there is some science to it but it's just it's really tricky it's really tricky yeah and you yeah, might... I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't really panic too much over uh, water temperatures I mean last year we were thinking that we were going to get corked with a with a hurricane and because the because of the uh, the sea temperatures were up, and uh, there was a couple of situations there where stuff got cooking down in the Gulf, and and the GFS wanted to bring it up our way, but nothing really materialized with that. I mean, I think you know the big thing here, and and what what plays such a huge factor in our uh, severe weather patterns up this way is the Bermuda High, and this year we haven't really had one. Last year, right. that's all we talked about, um, and and that was huge because, you know, all the severe weather that we had this year, that was all that stuff was going on in Ontario and Quebec last year, um, yeah. and now with the with the with the Bermuda High not even existing or being very weak, that stuff has been able to travel right up the coast. Now, you know, you take into consideration, you know, if Canada's dry, we're going to see a lot more clippers coming through here, which is always a red flag for me because any time that we get a clipper coming through here in the winter time. If it's got enough juice where it'll tap into some of that ocean energy uh, or ocean moisture, then that's gonna that's gonna dump a quick uh, six to twelve inches of snow on the you know on on the coastline. You know, and we've we've seen that happen here many times over the years, where you know what what looks what looks real innocent, you know, coming down all of a sudden just blossoms into this event that catches everybody by surprise and. And that's been my other major study in the wintertime is just watching these Alberta clippers and, and their interaction because uh, it may not affect you guys so much down in southern New England, but it, it, it could turn into a huge mess up here. Yeah. I'm going to ask you both the uh, same question. Um, Quincy, what um, what excites you the most about New England weather, and um, what is most exciting in New England as far as weather goes uh, cr- besides across the nation? I think the most exciting thing for New England weather, and especially Connecticut, and I guess coastal Maine could say this too, is we, we really have four seasons, but we can have anything from we can have blizzards, ice storms, we can have heat waves, cold snaps, we can have hurricanes, we can have literally almost everything. And I, I, I tell people the stat, 
the city of Bridgeport has been hit by a tornado, has been hit by a hurricane, the eye of a hurricane, back with glory, I believe it was. They've had 100-degree days. They've had below zero days. Not many cities can say that. So I think New England weather is really a little bit of everything, and you can expect almost anything. And that's really what excites me the most about being up here. You might. It's such a... It's such a melting pot here. I mean, because we get it all at one time or another, and and uh, the thing that, that's always excited me about it is the fact that uh, the forecast changes sometimes every six hours around here. You know, it, it's just you 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 see you set something up, and and then if you get the right factors in play, you get the northern jet and the southern jet coming together and and uh, or you got the nor'easter coming up the coast and and you got a trailing cold front dropping down from canada and you know and there's just so many different variables and all that and i mean it's 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 exciting at you know to be able to you know to see how the models play it out to see what actual observations play it out and 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 to see how your forecast comes out because I mean, there's just so many different things that go on around here. And again, you know, I, I, I really hammer on the fact that, you know, local experiences is, is such a key because, uh, you know, the, the things that fool, you know, the weather service and, and, and some, some of the media people, um, you know, the fact that they just, they don't, they don't understand the local influence that, that goes on here and, those that have been forecasting in New England for a while get it, and those that uh, you know that have been around and, and forecasting in this general area, you know, pick up on it over time and whatnot, and they, they create better forecasts. But uh, you know, there's just so many different variables at play. I don't know how many times I've seen, you know, these, these even in the summertime, these weak little disturbances drift down from the northwest, and and uh, you know, and a warm front coming up along the coast, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, you get into you get into severe weather and and with very little notice at all and and uh you know so i mean things happen on such short notice around here that uh you know you, it, it's something you have to keep your eye on i mean the old joke with the with the locals around here i mean if you don't like the weather just wait a minute um because it, cause sometimes it can change that quickly you know i yeah totally agree i mean my my most exciting and, and what i love about living in new england and especially on cape ann as we'll be in a peninsula, we got water on all sides, and and Mike knows this. I don't know if you know this too well, Quincy, but I'm a wind man. So every time we're on Twitter, we're joking about the super glue. Make sure you glue yourself down, bring the anchor, and he's always joking about you're gonna go out in the boat. We're gonna send you out in the boat in the wind, um, because I, I I like the I like the elements of Mother Nature as far as wind power goes. Uh, anything that has to deal with wind, severe thunderstorms, hurricanes, a nor'easter. A tornado. I mean, that is an adrenaline rush for me. Um, growing up as a kid, seeing trees snap, uh, Hurricane uh, Gloria, 1988. I was out on the golf course, and the gusts were literally lifting us right off um, our feet, about two, three inches off the ground. Um, Bob on the back shore out here on Atlantic Road. Just anything that's got to do with the wind, I love it. I love the power of it. Um, I will stay up if there's a high wind warning. I will focus on that. I will. I will let everybody know, you know, we're going to get high winds. People think I'm crazy, and I'll pred- I'll make predictions as far as roofs being blown off hotels before the storm even happens, um, and that's actually happened um, up here. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm the big wind man, and everybody knows that. Um, you guys must think the same. I mean, the power of wind in Mother Nature is unbelievable. I mean, isn't that an adrenaline rush or what? Well, it really is. Well, you can't really see the wind. You can see the trees and the leaves blowing, but unlike a, a tornado coming right at you, you can't see the wind coming at you. So all of a sudden, a big gust of wind, and boom, there you go. Well, that's right. When you're out there storm chasing, um, you you experience all the experience the wind. You experience the hail. Um, sometimes you get trapped trapped in the, the they call it the whale's mouth. Um, but you're usually outside of the storm center itself, so you don't get as far as you probably get as far as just a couple miles away, right from the from that storm, so you know your escape route, your your safe area. I do, but like I said before, November seventeenth last year, I had straight line winds of probably at least seventy, eighty miles an hour that were hitting me, and uh, then I decided, yeah, you know what? Let's let's take a step back a little bit and just kind of look at the storm as opposed to getting in right in the middle of it. Yeah, that's the thing. Like they can all extend out ahead of the severe storm, correct? Yeah, you can get these outflow gusts. I've actually seen 
severe thunderstorm warnings issued for outflow from a thunderstorm because the winds were that strong. Yeah. Well, my my this year actually I'm predicting um, a cold winter, um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put my money down on that. I mean, it can go either way. I think we're still in a neutral pattern right now. I I don't think it's an a a, an, um, a weak El Nino yet. Um, you know, but uh, like again, Rob Gutro, my guest last week, said that we're heading in that direction, and that you know the scientists are saying that you know we are getting into an El Nino, which does mean colder, more precipitation for New England compared to uh, a La Nina. So, with that being said, Quincy, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Um, go ahead and plug yourself for a couple minutes. Sure. So I'm really the, the most active on Twitter because I like the fact that unlike Facebook, when you tweet something, everyone that follows you can read it. But on Twitter, I'm at Danbury Weather. It's one word. I also have, and that's I do forecasting for Connecticut every day on there or most days. I do kind of cover the Northeast broadly, New York, um, New England. I have another Twitter account at Storm Chaser Q, which I, if I'm out of the state or if I'm storm chasing, I'll be constantly updating that. And I do I do post on Facebook. I'm Meteor, uh, Facebook.com slash meteorologist Quincy Vagel. It's right there. If you go to my Twitter, I have all the links for that. I do Instagram as well, but the biggest thing I think is just really Twitter. And I, I do have my own website. It's, it's QuincyVagel.com, and I post my daily forecasts. I do post the miscellaneous blogs, and I, I like to do little write-ups after my storm chases. So if you want to get more on that, I, I would say go to that website. So that's basically where you can find me. Cool. Thanks, Quincy. And uh, briefly, you, Mike? Yeah, you can find me at on Twitter at Western M E W X. Um my my blog site is Western W M E W yeah. Yeah, Western M E W X dot com. I use that predominantly when I have to do in depth discussions of storms. Um I do daily try to do daily forecasts and updates on uh, Facebook at uh Facebook dot com slash Western Main Weather. Um, you know, I'm in kind of in a fall mode right now. My daughter's a senior in high school, so I'm uh, chasing her around all over uh, New England as she participates in different athletic events and whatnot. So I'm trying to do the best that I can and sneak in stuff when I can. Um, but especially when uh, when winter comes and the snow starts to fly, uh, you can expect me to become uh, very active yet again, as I was uh, for the last couple of years. Awesome guys, awesome. Um, is there anything else you guys want to say before we, um, before I let you go? Thanks, well, Mike, Pete, for having us on. I really do appreciate it. And Quincy, it's great to hear your stories, and uh, glad to get you, get to know you uh, better. I think uh, um, people like yourself, and uh, you know, this is this is what we need is uh, you know, experienced young storm chasers like yourself that that have a hunger for uh, meteorology and and. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to. We've had some uh, some funny conversations and and uh, some snark on uh, Twitter that's been enjoyable. And uh, I really do appreciate uh, the insight that you passed along. And uh, it's going to be exciting to see you grow into this as the time goes ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks for the interaction. It's always been a lot of fun. And I really uh, encourage everyone out there, if you're in, active on Twitter, definitely interact with us because we will get back to you as we can. And it's great to just share reports and share insight and. Thanks, Peter, for having us. I think we had a lot of great conversations tonight and a lot of great stories. So, Quincy, Mike, it's been my pleasure. I'm honored to have you both on tonight. And I, I also want to tell all the listeners out there, you know, you can follow at Western Maine, Mike Haggett, um, at um, Danbury. Is it Danbury Weather, right? I'm not looking at my tweet Correct. on Twitter right yep. now. Or um, also your Storm Chase one, at Quincy Vogel, right? You have two, well, don't you? My Storm Chaser one is... Storm Chaser Q. I'm, some people oh, call me Q, right. so I kind of, I, I kind of ran with it. So. Confused with that. Um, and 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 everybody out there, listen. These two are the ones you want to follow on Twitter, and a bunch more of my guests I had before. Um, I look up to both of you. Uh, I think you guys are both doing great work. Um, and you know, it's good to see that everybody sticks together, helps each other out, um, and doesn't cause panic. One last thing before I let you guys go. Um, there's been a lot of stuff going on, on Twitter, and I've seen on Facebook um, and the media panicking the public about this upcoming winter, blah, 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 blah. This is what, you know, it's going to be crazy. This is crazy. What do you guys feel about panicking the public? I don't like it, um, but do you think that's like offset, piss off the public, or 
okay, we're going to make the uh, stores rich this year. Well, you know what? It's funny. I've worked in both TV and in um, um, retail, so I think a lot of it has to do with getting ratings and getting whether it be page views or clicks on TV. But I think a lot of it is just the hype and kind of stirring everything up. And the new thing with yeah. Facebook is that it, for a Facebook post to be shared and all that, it's it's all about engagement. So if one person puts this viral thing up that drives everyone crazy, that's more likely to be put into your feed. So it's really kind of this just this chain reaction, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I know that. And Mike, you? I know you don't like it. No, it drives me crazy. And uh, I ended up uh, getting into it with a local meteorologist here this week because he just, you know, somebody that's brand new to the region up here decides he's going to post a uh, graphic for a 20% chance of snow for the mountains that, uh, you know, really was unsubstantiated by uh, model guidance. And and, uh, and that's one of the things that I try to combat and one of the things that I try to hammer into to my followers is, you know, integrity does matter. And, and uh, part of the reason why we have so much apathy, I think, in uh, severe weather events is it's just because of the fact that, uh, you know, the media gets a hold of it and, and or the models. I mean, the models are just as guilty of hyping storms as anything. And, uh, and it doesn't pan out. And uh, so when the big storm hits, you know, you got those people that are down off the coast on the outer banks of North Carolina or Cape Cod saying, oh, no, we're going to ride this one out, and then that's the last to see of them because they're they're gone after that. So, I mean, you know, it, it, that's, that's, that's that's always been a, a, a real touchy subject with me. I've approached people at the American Meteorological Society and, uh, yeah. and others that will at least listen because it, it, it drives me foolish. Well, listen, guys, it was great having you both on my show tonight. I would love to have you both again. Um, we could talk on... Maybe an upcoming event that we um, witness this winter or some kind of storm um, that we could just talk all about. But uh, thanks again for coming, both of you. Um, Mike Haggett, Quincy Vogel, Vagel, thank you so much, guys, for coming on the show tonight. I love you guys. Thanks again, Peter. Thank you. It's been great fun. All right, man. Have a good night, guys. You too. Take care. All right, bye-bye. Well, that was Quincy Vagel and my friend uh, Mike Haggett. Um, what a great show it was. Um, I just want to thank our sponsors tonight, Fort Williams Henry, Lake George, New York. Um, love it up there. Seen for Paracon 1, Paracon 2, hopefully Paracon 3. Uh, Rolling Hills Island, Victavia, New York. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Yes, I'm going to get there. Uh, to answer a quick question, I want to thank all my listeners out there tonight for coming on tonight and listening to the show I love you all, and I, and I thank you for your support and follow my fan page on Wicked Weather on Facebook um, and at, at Peter Lavasco on Twitter. And for all you um, critics out there, look, I can take the criticism. It's a fun show, you know, and I'm a weather forecaster, weather enthusiast. I'm not, on paper, a meteorologist, just so you know that. So if we get off a subject, don't lose... Um, your stomach. Um, anyways, uh, Twister Kid has a quick question for me. It says, uh, Peter, what do you find scary being in the direct path of a Twister or being in the path of a shark? Um, what do I find being in the path of a Twister? Um, to answer your question quick, Twister Kid, um, uh, scary, very scary. Um, you drive the opposite way or you run like hell or you get into a low, um, low lying low lying place somewhere um and the next question was um but twisted for being in the path of a shark well i don't know what do you do if there's a shark coming towards you you just don't swim near it right you swim away from it <laughs> all right well hope that answers your questions i want to thank again my guest tonight mike haggett uh western maine weather um danbury weather uh quincy vogel uh meteorologist out of connecticut Storm Chaser, it was a great time having you guys on the show tonight. Next week, we're going to be talking paranormal and weather with Joni Mayhem. I hope I said that, Joni, right? Um, Joni is the author of Bones in the Basement. It's a book we'll be talking about. Um, I actually did some um, investigating at the Victoria Mansion, and um, I had my own experience. You're going to have to tune into that. And guess what? I'm in the book. So, thank you all again. I love you all. Have a great Saturday night. Enjoy your Sunday. Go Pats. Pats win. Hopefully, um, prediction, Oakland Raiders, we win 35-7. to 7. 
That's my prediction. And watch out for a few showers in the morning up here in southern New England. Maybe the rumble of thunder. Have a great Saturday night. Love you all. Bye-bye.